Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to see that you're all able to join us. I'm sure we'll have a few more joining in the next few minutes. There goes another one. Welcome. We are today running a session on delivering simple, secure, and scale-out infrastructure with my colleagues from Nutanix and Rubrik. In this session, we're going to look at some of the key technologies and the market space around this and why this kind of technology has real influence in your future data centers and your customers and the way they want to build their data centers. So welcome. My name is Tony Ryan. I'm the exclusive group chief technologist. And we have with us today my colleagues from Nutanix and also from Rubrik. Hello. Good afternoon. So Jan and Jerry, welcome along to the session. Yes, we are. So in a lead up to this, what we're going to look at is uh, a little bit of the reasons why we believe at uh, Big Tech that this is such an important technology set for our partners and our customers to be looking at. So one thing we noticed from the very recent report, so Canalyst, which is a, a, an organization which does market analysis, looked at this particular part of the market uh, and through a series of surveys with partners working in this space, they tried to determine what way this market is moving. And as we can see from these charts, the hyperconverged infrastructure is in increase in almost every situation with all of those reseller partners. So we're seeing a definite growth in demand from the end user organizations in this kind of technology. This we believe is simply because the, the move towards the software defined data center is already underway. It is the way of the future for many data centers. And in fact, we also recognize that the use of cloud applications, which is a second area of the investigation, is also massively on the increase. We're no longer in the space where this is a technology which people are interested in, just mildly interested in. It is now becoming a normal and everyday part of their trading and an everyday part of their technology infrastructure. And of course, that software-defined infrastructure goes alongside this. And in order to create what we believe many organizations will, to some extent or another, the hybrid data center, where they use some forms of cloud applications, so software as a service, some elements of infrastructure as a service, and other elements of on-premise private cloud, that software-defined infrastructure is essential in order to smooth the operational aspects of combining that hybrid system. So to that end, Big Tech as a company has been creating the software-defined architecture that we believe is going to be a fundamental aspect, uh, and this is our preferred route to that. As part of that, today we're going to be concentrating on the Nutanix and Rubrik building blocks, the core pieces of this infrastructure. With that, I'll hand over now to Jan, uh, welcome, Jan. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to be here, friends of Big Tech and Rubrik. And uh, indeed, in the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, I'll be happy to provide an overview on the Nutanix technology and the value it brings. Um, and as you can see, Nutanix is being recognized globally as the enterprise cloud company, as the intellectual property of the company and the magic sauce is in the software. I'll be explaining what the Nutanix promises, what it can deliver to your data center, as we are replatforming data centers, thousands of data centers across the globe. And we'll also give a lead in on how we believe that the Nutanix solution works together in a very good way um, with the technology of our friends at Rubik. Uh, yeah, here we go. So we can definitely say that the cloud era is well underway. If you look at the growth of Amazon Web Services, but also to the growth of Microsoft uh, with Azure or Google, you can see that a lot of, lots of organizations are putting workloads in the cloud. And the reasons for this are very clearly defined and are very well known as well, as hundreds of thousands of uh, VMs are already running in the cloud across the globe. The four main things to do this is uh, the rapid time to market. If you want to have an application up and running, you can do that in five minutes uh, using the self-service portal at Amazon Web Services. Swipe your credit cards and get your VMs running in no time. Fractional IT consumption is another benefit where you can just uh, pay for what you need. And the moment you need more, you can take small incremental steps scaling out as the needs of the application in terms of performance and capacity needs. Another big advantage, of course, is the one-click uh, simplicity, being able to uh, just focus on the applications and not bother about all that complex infrastructure that goes underneath in terms of servers, fiber channels, storage arrays, 
You don't have to bother with lums and volumes and masking and rig groups and all of that other complexity which bundles together what is needed to get your PMs to run. And then number four, of course, continuous innovation. Amazon Web Services alone is releasing dozens and dozens of new features um, every three months and uh, they are getting consumed very quickly. So that continuous innovation uh, that you can take advantage of uh, in the cloud is also a very important factor of that move. Now, what we have seen is that although these four things make up uh, the goodness of the cloud, um, we can see that next to fractional consumption, instant delivery, invisible operations and continuous innovation, uh, people also have some other requirements that are not always delivered by the public cloud. And that's where the difficulty begins. Because the public cloud is, uh, is very good for applications that don't have any strict laws with regards to data privacy and information assurance. It's also very good for bursty applications where you cannot predict how the workload will behave. However, if you look at predictable workloads that have a very stringent need with regards to information assurance, the public cloud is not an option. So what people want is they would like to have the benefits of public cloud, but combined with the control what they already experienced in the privacy of their own on-premise data center. Because anything you do inside has a couple of advantages that the public cloud can never bring to you. Like, for example, giving you the right balance between owning and renting. When you're in the public cloud, it's obvious that you're renting infrastructure. And on the long run, this is always more expensive than doing it yourself. So the moment that you have a predictable workload, which needs to, uh, which holds sensitive data, which uh, is under strict data privacy laws, those controllable and predictable workloads are much more cost effective to hosting your own data center. It's like renting a hotel room when you're abroad for a few days and, and buying a house when you're relocating and buying, living somewhere for a couple of years. Another thing is data access and governance. As I already said, not every piece of data can be hosted in the public cloud because you're not always 100% sure uh, what the data retention schema is of your data, or who is exposed to this data, or if this data is moving around or going beyond uh, country borders. Tailored SLAs for every app. The public cloud is not really well at tailoring as SLAs for distinct apps, bespoke apps. It's good for wholesale compute and storage, but when it comes to providing really customized SLAs for an app that is very particular to your business, it is very difficult. And then, of course, choice and freedom from lock-in. Because the public cloud is maybe sometimes easy to move in, but it's not that easy to move out again. From that perspective, it sometimes looks like Hotel California. You can get in, but you cannot get out. So this is where Nutanix clearly comes in, because it provides you the best of both worlds. What Nutanix has been offering its partners and also its customers globally is that you can have the public cloud experience, but this time in the privacy of your own data center. And this picture has been on the back of the, um, of the Wall Street Journal, and it actually depicts that there, are, there is another way. Because if you look at VMware, VMware has brought amazing technology to all of us. And they're probably the most revolutionary technology in the last 10 years in the data center. And we respect and we are very grateful for that innovation. However, um, virtualization is just one step to have an agile cloud-like or Google-like infrastructure. It is just one step. It offers you a runtime that makes you do things like vMotion and DRS, but it does not provide you the same experience as Amazon Web Services in terms of being able to consume in a fractional way, very quickly, scale out, and so on. So Amazon Web Services is, is, of course, alternative number two, where you move everything in the public cloud. But I've already indicated that this is not a viable option for some obvious reasons. So Nutanix is the middle way, brings you the best of both worlds, giving you the cloud-like experience in the privacy of your own data center. So what does this mean? 
This means that today thousands and thousands of data centers are running on Nutanix, carrying in critical workloads. And what they have actually done in their data center is do a complete replatform of it. And this is not an instance where you replace your whole infrastructure, but it's just when you bring on new workloads instead of doing the old way like depicted here, with separate servers connected to fiber channel, connected to storage controllers, and then into the storage arrays. Instead of doing it that way, it should be done in a web scale way, which is actually developed and built by Nutanix, making sure that whatever Google and Facebook and Amazon did in their data centers, that you have it in your data center now. So making sure that you collapse and integrate compute, storage, networking, virtualization into one beautifully integrated uh, solution. And that this is preventing you of having to manage all these different components together. Compute, storage, virtualization, all integrated in a scale-out architecture where you just have server nodes with local storage connected to the server nodes running a hypervisor of choice and then all the VMs are running on top of that hypervisor, on top of that cluster of server nodes, making use of the local disks uh, being storage medium. And the software will give you all the features and benefits that you're used to in the three-tier world. So now you can start small, start to scale out, node by node, as you need it, completely integrated, making sure that all the complexity is hidden. Now, as I already said, you can have your integrated scale-out compute and storage cluster by Nutanix. Virtualization layer can be of choice, meaning that you can virtualize with VMware, with Hyper-V, or even with the built-in hypervisor called Acropolis Hypervisor, which is a new generation hypervisor which comes at no additional cost, allowing you now to just concentrate on the applications. You have just made everything from the hypervisor down invisible. Now, how does this actually work? That's what you see in this picture. A Nutanix cluster comprises of three or more nodes. These are plain server nodes holding compute, memory, and storage through locally attached disks. They are virtualized with a hypervisor of choice. And on top of the hypervisor, your user VMs run, but also a special virtual machine runs, which is the secret sauce that Nutanix brings. This is called the controller VM. It's a virtual machine that runs on every node in the cluster. These virtual machines are actually uh, providing all the Nutanix goodness. The controller VM is making sure that VMs that are running on a node can use the local storage or the storage of any other node as their storage medium. And that all the storage features and benefits that you are used to from the hardware are now provided in software. So the first important thing that the controller VM provides on your cluster is a distributed storage fabric, presenting the local attached disks of all the nodes as one pool of resources to your hypervisor as an NFS target when you're using VMware, as an SMB target when you're using Microsoft, iSCSI when you're using something else. And this distributed storage fabric is providing all the benefits and features that you're used to from your traditional storage array, which could be EMC or NetApp or anything else. Snapshots, clones, steering, compression, deduplication, erosion coding, replication in terms of resilience and failover, all these things are provided by the Nutanix software. Now, another thing that the Nutanix goodness offers you is what is called the application mobility fabric. And this allows you to run your VMs on any hypervisor or even not in a VM or uh, even in, in, in containers. So the app mobility fabric allows you to re-image nodes into a different hypervisor with one click without any downtime. So this means that VMs uh, running on uh, ESXi one moment could be running on Hyper-V or on the built-in Acropervisor with one single click. You can have multiple hypervisors running in your cluster and you can change nodes from one hypervisor to the other and the VMs will be massaged so that they can run on the new alternate hypervisor. So now you can do one click hypervisor conversion moving VMs from one hypervisor to the other or even moving from a VM into a container. Now this concept of the app mobility fabric is also extended to the cloud. This means that when VMs are running 
in the privacy of your own data center, but at a certain moment you have unpredictable workloads or you want to burst or back up into the cloud, this can be done also with one click. So now you have effectively built a bridge between the privacy of your own data center and the goodness of the public cloud. We are working together with Amazon Web Services, with Azure, and there are other ways of uh, breaking out of your own data center as well. With one click, now you can move applications from one hypervisor to the other and from your own premise infrastructure to the cloud, back and forward. Now to conclude, what does this all mean? The enterprise cloud is providing you a cloud-like experience in the privacy of your own data center. And it's built in such a way that the business value cannot be denied. These are numbers that are coming from independent researchers that have been doing research with financial officers that were building their data centers in a traditional way and at some point moved to Nutanix-like architecture. And what you see here is that the five-year return on investment is 510%, meaning that building a data center the Nutanix way allows you to get five euros or five pounds back for every euro or pound that you put into it. Within a year, your investment is paid back by the savings that you do. And the savings are over 58% year over year. It's not only the business benefits with regards to cost savings, but it's also how quickly you can deploy new applications, innovate and bring your business to the digital era. When it comes to deploying the Nutanix solution, it is 85% quicker to deploy and get operating than any other three-tier infrastructure. If you look at the management of the environment, people are spending more than 70% less time on managing their underlying infrastructure than they used to do with Flexbox or VBlocks or NetTops or Nimbles or Tintrees or any of those other three-tier architectures. And most importantly, there are more than 98% less or fewer occurrences of unplanned downtime. And this is because the Nutanix technology and software is built like the software that Google is using or other web scale companies, making sure that it can route around failures automatically. So anything can fail from a disk to a node to a rack to a complete data center, and all traffic and all requests will be routed around those failures, and the system will self-heal itself. So, having said that, uh, I hope that this has triggered your attention to uh, get on a journey to innovate your data center together with us and to see also that this technology can be beneficial for any type of workload. VDI, branch office, enterprise applications, SAP, Oracle, SQL, SharePoint, big data, unified communication, all different virtualized workloads can benefit from this new way of building your data center. Many thanks, Jan. That was an excellent session, a great introduction to the technology. I'll check just now for any questions immediately. There are no questions showing at the moment, so I think we'll stick to looking at all the questions towards the end. What I'd like to do now is hand over to the next part of the session to Jerry. Yes, thank you. So there's a lot of similarities to the approach that Nutanix uh, has to the primary stack, where rubric has, has a similar philosophy and a similar way of looking at a data center, but for the secondary stack. Uh, and the secondary stack, I mean the backup and recovery. So the real problem of what a lot of customers are facing today is you are building you know, a state-of-the-art, hyper-converged, software-converged data center for the primary tier, and then you have your 10-year-old backup application. It runs on a best-of-breed solutions, disks and storage and components. And it basically all has to be put together as a, uh, a backup platform. The scaling, the management, everything is done uh, by you as a customer. The problem with this is it's very hard to scale and it's becoming more and more complex. On the primary tier, it is so easy to you know, get a new VM commissioned, have it running, etc. But then to integrate it into a, a legacy backup application and strategy, it's, uh, it's becoming extremely difficult. And it doesn't match, right? So what Rubrik has done is set out to say, okay, let's build a backup technology that can protect the forward-looking data centers in a much simpler and scalable way. The similarities on technology are the same, right? It's the Google-like thinking about an infrastructure. 
no single component should ever have an impact. Scalability should never have an impact, right? Everything should be captured by the software that is running on the platform. So that's what we've done. We've combined all the pieces and components of backup technology into a single system. And how we did that. So how we did this, our company was, was founded two and a half years ago. And if the interesting part is, I won't go through the, uh, the resumes of all these people, but uh, the interesting part here is that if you look at our, our founders and our engineering team, everybody has a background in either Google, Facebook, or uh, enterprise technology, but not a single person comes from a traditional backup software vendor. There's literally no one in our engineering team that has any legacy in backup and recovery. So what they said is, okay, we're gonna build a backup and recovery platform that has four primary principles. The first of all, it's gonna be converged software. We're gonna put everything into a scale-out platform in a completely masterless distributed design. We're gonna use x86 commodity hardware and build a software stack on top of that that does all the backup and recovery uh, without any need for clients, agents, licenses whatsoever. The second one is businesses have an SLA. That SLA is uh, based on timing, uh, you know, how many backups per day do you want, how many weeks, months, and years do you want to keep those backups, and why should that translate to a person figuring out a backup schedule? That machine runs at that time, and that machine does a full on Friday at 7. There's a much smarter way of doing that. Is that that's basically what the, the system will do for you. So we automate the entire SLA. You put the, uh, the needed SLA into the system, I want so many copies per day, I want to keep them for so long, I want to replicate them to that location. Uh, rubric, go figure it out. So we have completely automated that, that stack. The third one, if you have a lot of engineers from Google, of course you're going to quickly have a nice white search bar in your GUI with a global search functionality. So um, no matter where data is stored, you know, it could be on a local rubric, it could be uh, on a public cloud or an object store, Everything is globally searchable from the rubric indexes. And last but not least, the system is going to be built on APIs. 100% REST API built from the ground up, which means that everything inside the rubric platform can be completely automated and orchestrated using uh, the tools out there. So with those, those four key principles, we designed the system. And uh, first of all, the key driver was simplicity. Backup is on the end of the day, it's just backup, right? It needs to happen. It's important in case of, of failures and, and emergencies. But backup of a 1,000 VM data center should be as simple as making a backup of a couple of cell phones, right? It just happens. You don't schedule things. You don't constantly check things. You configure what you want once, and then it's done, and you forget about it. And that is exactly the same approach we have. So first of all, the setup. It is super simple. The machine will be up and running in 15 minutes. What it needs is, is IP connectivity, DNS, NTP, and a connection to your hypervisor. We will uh, be started to ingest backups in less than 15 minutes. The second one is you create an SLA. In that SLA, you just say, okay, here's the frequency, here's the time you have to store it, here's my replication strategy, and here's where I want you to put my multi-month, multi-year backups. Same goes for the archiving part, where do I want to keep data that has a protection need for five years, seven years, ten years? Do I want to really keep that on a high-performing backup restore platform? Or maybe, if it's seven years old, maybe it's a lot smarter for six and a half years to move it away from my primary platform and store it somewhere cheap. That somewhere cheap, it could be an Amazon, an AWS, or an Azure account. It could also be a Cloudium, or a Cleversafe, or a Scality, or an NFS mount. So basically anything that speaks NFS or S3, we can utilize as a long-term archiving platform. And again, of course, with deduplication, etc. but while keeping all those backups inside the rubric indexes, with the ability to instantly recover those files, of folders and VMs. So look at this, the hardware specification of a rubric platform. Um, it looks a lot like, like the, the Nutanix uh, systems, right? It's a multi-node to you appliance. Every appliance has uh, three or four nodes inside, and each node has 
a combination of its own CPUs, its own SSDs, hard drives, and 10 gig Ethernet connections. Uh, the four of them work as independently from each other as one global cluster, but a single machine actually is a very high-powered uh, platform. So a single brick, we call those two appliances a brick, a brick can give you 30,000 IOPS of instant performance. What that means is that if we take a backup of a VM, we can actually, uh, if you want to recover, let's say you need to recover a one terabyte VM that's been protected uh, on a daily basis, uh, you know, four times per day, and we get a message that says, okay, you know, there's a, a crypto locker or ransomware or whatever on that VM. Uh, we think it was installed uh, three days ago. We need to go back in time to last Friday evening. You actually go to the rubric GUI, you'll click the VM of Friday evening, and you'll just say, recover. So what the system actually does, it opens up an NFS mount over 10 gig Ethernet straight to the ESX host and says, here you are. Here's your VM. It was protected last Friday. Please boot it up. This means that any version of any VM that you are running in, in your hypervisor we can recover it in the same amount that it actually takes to, to boot up a VM. So you can literally do a near zero instant disaster recovery straight from the platform. If everything is fine and up and running again, I do a storage emotion back to primary storage. Super simple. It's, this is literally a four or five mouse click transaction and takes a, a, it's a question of seconds to do an instant recovery of any protected VM. On the scalability part, as I said, there are multiple nodes in a single appliance. It's a completely masterless design, so everybody is identical. There's not a proxy or a single master server or anything. Everybody does, does every role inside the cluster. You know, it's a distributed approach, so you just add as many nodes as you want. So I, I put some indication numbers here. You know, there's nothing uh, uh, fixed about this. It could be 300 VMs, it could be 600 VMs, depending on the size of, uh, of the machines, etc., and the retention period. But the simplicity, uh, both from a performance scalability and a capacity scalability, it just keeps growing forever. The largest customers we're seeing now can easily put 20 bricks inside a single cluster, which means you have 80 independent nodes all working as one global file system. Uh, one global backup cluster. On the reliability part, of course, this is your platform of last resort, right? You have you have a hypervisor, or you have a, a, a very cool a hyperconverged primary platform like Nutanix, where you have you know fantastic technologies to protect data, make snapshots, etc. But this is your platform of last resort, right? This is where your history is, where your multi-month and year backups are stored, and when everything else goes wrong that system should still be running. So we do triple data mirroring on every single piece of data, not only the backup blocks, but also all the indexing and metadata. As said, it's completely masterless, but it also does global deduplication. So our file system, no matter how many bricks you have running inside a cluster, you have global deduplication over the entire file system. With a lot of traditional backup solutions, you see that you have deduplication per backup target or deduplication per backup proxy server. None of that is the case for Rubrik. Uh, deduplication is not something you can select or anything. It is global over the entire cluster of, uh, of systems. So as said, completely triple data mirroring. The same goes for the metadata. So it's a distributed metadata service that is completely masterless and decentralized. It has the auto-healing functionality in case of, you know, bit flips, etc. People that are doing backups for, you know, multiple years, uh, almost everybody in his lifetime has seen a backup index get corrupted or, or you know, having to recover backup indexes is, is, is very painful. Uh, those days are over uh, with the, the distributed metadata layer of Rubrik. From a managementability point of view, the GUI of a Rubrik cluster is based on people that are managing and monitoring the primary environment, you know, in the old days you used to have specialists for these are the server people, these are the network people, these are the storage people, these are the backup people. We are not only converging and hyper-converging our platforms, we're also doing that with people, right? So every administrator should know a little bit about everything and 
that is uh, our basis on which we built the GUI. Everybody that has some sort of IT administration experience should be able to protect. And so that is the way the GUI was designed. Everything can be done in four mouse clicks. Create new backups, restore a file, restore a folder, restore an entire VM from a HTML5 GUI that works on, on every platform. And for the larger environments, we actually publicize. So on every node, you have a fully indexed uh, library of the REST API calls inside your system. So uh, every REST API command that we can do, uh, you can actually run it straight from the GUI from the machine. Uh, you can test it, you can try it out, you know, copy and paste the, the output or the curl sp uh, scripts. We have a large community actually on GitHub where we realize workflows and all of those, you know, PowerShell gallery scripts, everything is pre-publicized to make complete automation, truly invisible backup and recovery run by, you know, an orchestration platform. We actually make that possible and we have a lot of customers already doing that today. So I think, you know, the two technologies, both Nutanix and Rubrik, we're here to you know, make, make the world, you know, a lot simpler, or at least not the world, the IT you know, infrastructure world, right? Uh, we want to make it super simple, super reliable, scalable, and easy to manage. In a traditional best-of-breed solution, those are always the goals. I think the true way to actually reach that is by just converging as much of the components as possible, using smart algorithms and software to take away manual processes or that are really 10, 20 years old, really need to go away. We need to replace all those legacy infrastructures with a lot smarter technology that enables you to instantly deploy it, manage it, and, and scale out without any impact, a very low impact financially and no impact at all at production, etc. So with that, we have a large amount of customers that are already using combination of uh, Nutanix Hyperconverge and Rubrik Converge Backup. For both our companies and our uh, distributor BitTech, we have the ability to demonstrate what the combined solution of these two technologies can actually bring into an infrastructure. We love to prove that you know this is not just pretty pictures on the slide. It is really that simple. We can really have an entire infrastructure running in a matter of hours, and we love nothing more than proving that to you. With that, on behalf of myself and Jan, I truly thank you for your attention. If there are any questions from the audience. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Jerry. That was also an excellent session. I'll check now for questions. I think there's one or two coming in. How do I know how many appliances they need? That's from Jan. Yeah, um, so you need to order, the minimum order is 10,000, but we also go with 9,000. No, that's a joke, of course. The number of appliances, of course, depends on the workloads, what it needs in terms of capacity and performance. The minimum to create a cluster is three nodes because it's a distributed architecture. Um, which allows, of course, for data replication, failover, and so on and so forth. It's using uh, new generation web scale technologies like Mesos and Kubernetes and so on. So that's why three nodes is a minimum. And there is a portfolio of different types of nodes available uh, with different uh, varieties of compute, memory, and storage resources. And Nutanix provides something which is called the Nutanix Sizer. If you Google for Nutanix Sizer, you will find that application. And uh, it allows you to um, identify uh, which workload you want to run, if it's Microsoft Exchange that you're virtualizing or it's uh, desktop virtualization that you're doing, how many desktops you need for power users, kiosk users, and so on. And by giving that basic information, the Sizer will automatically size your cluster for your needs. And uh, again, it will start with three nodes. Um, if the application is very compute intensive, it will be nodes with lots of compute and uh, maybe medium amount of storage. If it's storage heavy, it will give you lots uh, of storage heavy nodes. Now, the, the beauty is that you can mix and match different types of nodes uh, in the same cluster. So you can always scale out your cluster to what you need in terms of compute and storage um, as your applications and your business is growing. So I hope that was an answer to the question from a Nutanix perspective. Actually, from a Rubrik perspective, uh, there, there's a lot of similarities to, to that answer. Um, the only the real difference here is that um, to do a good sizing for a backup infrastructure, um, there's a couple of metrics that are important. Uh, of course, you know, 
it's the, the capacity that is in use of the primary platform. But there was also metrics like, uh, you know, uh, how many versions do you want to, uh, how many protection points do you want per day? How many days, weeks, months, or years do you want to store? What is a change rate of environments? Uh, what is the deduplication ratios that can be expected? So there's a couple of um, couple of metrics that need to be identified before you can truly make uh, uh, a good sizing. Of course, from a technical point of view, you can you know, scale it up as much as needed. From a financial point of view, um, doing a little bit of homework and understanding an infrastructure before we actually uh, size an environment is very important. And I would love to help you know anyone, partner and customer who needs uh, who needs help understanding the way it, it sizes. There are tools available, uh, but there's also uh, a large team of uh, Rubrik people uh, ready to help with that. Okay, got one. I think this is predominantly for Rubrik at this stage. How secure is the archive in a public cloud? Yeah, how long does it take to get it back? Okay, so how secure is it? That is really, so beat Rubrik systems, the replication, of course, you know, it's AES256 encrypted, etc. But once you move it into a public archive, you're really depending on the technologies of that archive. The good thing is that AWS and a lot of the S3 capable platforms out there, they actually have the encryption features. So uh, if you are running an S3 platform that allows S3 based encryption, encryption at rest, we will utilize those capabilities. So it will be fully encrypted uh, in flight and at rest in the archive. Excellent. Oh, I think this is another one for, uh, for you. Jerry, does uh, Rubrik support backup to tape? No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, there's mixed emotions on that question because on the one hand, it is still a standard that is being used by a lot of companies. What we find out, unfortunately, is that a lot of those usage of tape is actually you know, still being done based on rules and regulations or done by someone that says we've always done it this way. We believe that the metrics of both, both on-premise and public cloud. If you look at uh, that's actually sorry, I forgot the answer that that part of the question on the on the previous question. If you can store data for a very long period for a very uh, small amount of money, you're talking about one cent per gig per month. You can do that in a deduplicated way with Rubrik. If you store a one terabyte VM for multiple years inside a public cloud, to take out a single file or folder out of that VM, we actually only need the deltas. So let's say you have a one terabyte VM and you need to recover a 10 megabyte file that is inside of the VM. What you do is you go to the Rubik cluster, you search for the name of the file, you type in two or three letters, the Google-like search engine uh, shows you, okay, you probably need this file. It is stored in your AWS account or in your Azure account. What we'll actually do is we'll just grab the blocks that we need from that cloud provider. So what we actually have now is an ability to store long-term backups. You know, it can be five years, can be 10 years, whatever. Do it with financial metrics that are, in most of the cases, almost is, uh, come very close to the financials of tape, but without the hassle, the constant, you know, how is the lifetime of my tapes? When do I switch tape technologies from version four to version five, etc.? You know, we can just store it for most platforms you know, charging one cent per gig per month uh, and keep it there for a very long time. So, very long answer to a very simple question, but we don't believe in, in the future of tape, right? We want to make things as simple as possible, and although backup to tape makes things cheaper, it is so much more complex than just stored it in, in a public or an on-premise cloud solution. And there's all that huge amount of space that you need to store very large tape archives as well. I used to work at a couple of places which had that kind of tape store. It becomes a very expensive operation on its own. So I can well understand the, uh, the yes. need to move away from tape. Uh, I've got another question, and this is a more general one. So we'll take it one each, if you don't mind. Uh, given the changes in the technology space, what do you think are the driving factors for organizations adopting it? And we'll start, first of all, if I may, with you again, Jerry. Yes, absolutely. There's a very interesting study done by by IDC where they said you know the digital universe in 2020 so which is you know sounds like it's very far but it's actually only four years from now where where you see what unstructured data what the impact is on you know IT budgets on the staffing five years from now it is predicted that every IT admin is running about 500 percent more capacity than he is today or she all right so there's a lot of things going on, and 
I think automation orchestration, the things that have been happening in the, in the Google, Facebook, Twitter data centers for many years ago, they're now moving into the enterprise, the, the standard data centers. It, there is a massive need to make things super dynamic, super scalable, super simple, because that is the only way we're going to keep up with the growth that keeps coming at us. Not only the number of VMs, but the number of terabytes, you know, and everything that coexists with that. I think that is the primary driver, making things super simple, super scalable and automated as much as possible. Please, Jan. No, so um, it, it's very clear that business is becoming digital, uh, digital transformation. Some businesses are only digital. If you look at, for example, um, Airbnb, they're the largest uh, hotel chain in the world and they don't own a single hotel room. If you look at um, maybe Uber, Uber is the biggest taxi company in the world and they don't own a single cab. So these are pure digital businesses and this is happening to every vertical. For example, a hospital, how can they use IT to get the results of a mammography to the patient quicker? How can the entertainment industry survive when the sales on CDs go down? Apple gives you a complete new experience with iTunes and Apple Music and so on. So actually what we see is that businesses in order to survive they have to leverage IT to innovate and to bring new applications that are suited to their customers, that are bringing their customers a delightful experience, which is personalized, which is mobile. And this innovation will make the difference between surviving or just dying. And today with the complexity in the data center with servers and fiber channel and, and rate groups and net up filers and all that stuff that needs to be glued together with duct tape and spit, they are spending 80% of their time on keeping the lights on and only 20% on innovation. So in order to bring a new delightful experience, businesses need to innovate and they have to flip that around. They need to spend 80% of their time on innovation. And with all the complexity that is going on in the old 3-tier world, in the V-Box and the flex spots of this world, this is impossible. So the reason of the success behind hyperconvergence and convergence is because it will provides a much more simple way to make infrastructure completely invisible so that people can concentrate on the business and the apps. And that is probably the reason why Nutanix is the fastest growing company in IT on the planet for the last 10 years. So I, I believe this is a trend that is simply unstoppable. I, I would agree. I think for me, everyone is used to using applications on a phone that are simple. You use them when you need them. You discard them when you don't need them. And I think we're all beginning to expect that as our way of doing business. And it's companies that will succeed are the ones who accept that challenge and respond to it. And it's this kind of technology that enables that. Uh, I have another question now from Ahab. Can I restore a backup taken from other solutions into Rubrik? So I guess that's for you, Jerry. No, you cannot. Um, the way we uh, we take backups of environments are through the API of the hypervisor. So in case of uh, VMware, that is VADP, the VMware API for data protection. We can ingest any type of data that we can access through the API of VMware. If it's not in there, we won't be able to backup and recover. So the answer is no. From other backup applications, uh, we're not able to do that. If you spin that data back into your hypervising environment, then we'll be uh, perfectly fine protecting it. Excellent. Thank you. And there's another one here from Maggie, and I think this applies equally to both, especially in hybrid environments where you're using some combination of on-prem and maybe a second data center or infrastructure as a service in the cloud or whatever. Do you utilize any kind of WAN accelerator? So we'll start with Yaf, we may. So one acceleration is built into the Nutanix product in terms of how we treat data that needs to be replicated and moved around across multiple nodes. So if you look at data management and data application or application acceleration, which is done by uh, companies like uh, Silver Peak and Riverbed and so on and so forth, it has taken them 10 to 15 years to perfect this and to uh, put things in the edge so that when somebody is working locally but the data is stored in a data center, that uh, all the caching that is done locally and all the magic that is going on locally in this one accelerator make it feel for the end user as if the application is local. Now this is very sophisticated one acceleration and this is done the, on the remote office. 
So that is not relevant to us. What is relevant to us is the way we handle data that needs to be replicated and the way that we send data over the wire when it needs to cross the wire. Whenever that is done, we uh, are making sure that the data is compressed in such a way and that we only do fragmented transactions and so on, that we only do the, the deltas, so that we're using as little as possible on the wire in the data center, east to west, but also between data centers north to south, you will see that one acceleration is built into uh, the software. And Jerry, how, how is, is that a, a feature of, available within the rubric set? It's actually a very funny question because uh, one of the four founders of Rubrik, uh, AJ, Arvin Jane, he was actually the founding engineer of Riverbed. So you can bet your behind we know how to do when acceleration. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, there's a question from David. I think it's for you, Jerry, on the Rubrik side. Uh, when is AHV or Hyper-V coming in terms of support for Rubrik? As soon as we want, or at least as soon as we can. So. Like I said in uh, in the beginning of, of my story, is you know we want to utilize APIs because where we don't want to be is ending up with a large compatibility matrixes of rubric can make backups in case you have this storage array on this firmware together with this hypervisor on this platform. Uh, we want to stay away from that. That means we need APIs to do our our job, right? To take our backups, to mount our restores, etc. Those APIs are you know, becoming a standard more and more, but for specifically for Hyper-V uh, and for Acropolis AHV, they're still under development. It's very hard to put a time scale on that, but I would say stay tuned for uh, probably the next six to nine months. Oh, okay, so it's a kind of thing that's in development at the moment. It is. It is fully in development and we're fully committed to support every hypervisor in the world. Uh, the, quest the real question is timing and availability of APIs. Indeed, indeed. So uh, another question from Ahab, is there any solution for Rubrik to do backup to branch office without placing a box in that branch office? Yes, there is. Somebody, somebody saw our roadmap, <laughs> or not, uh, or we have a very good roadmap uh, understanding what our customers want. But what we're about to release is a product called Rubrik Edge, which is specifically designed for smaller remote offices, where you will actually have a Rubrik uh, or a VBrick, so a virtual Rubrik platform that you can run as an OVA or hypervisor that will be able to protect small 10, 20, 50 VM kind of environments and have it uh, one optimized, deduplicated, and replicated back to a, uh, a primary data center with a physical rubric. So yes, that's uh, coming on a very, very short notice. Excellent. And oh, this is a uh, one around the disaster recovery from within, again, for rubric. So again, it's for you, Jerry. What does re disaster recovery look like within rubric? Do I need to storage vMotion every VM? And that's from Maggie. So it, uh, what's it look like and what's involved in setting up that recovery large-scale recovery, I think that's what you're pointing at, Maggie, yes. for large uh, maybe VMs. Yes, food is lost. Yeah. 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 So let's paint a hypothetical picture here. Let's say you have an environment with uh, 500 VMs, uh, you know, a couple of a dozen of terabytes of data. Let's say you have a full-blown disaster and you have two replicating rubrics on, on two locations, uh, right? So one, one on each location. What we'll do is, of course, uh, all the backups have been done. They've been rec uh, replicated to the secondary site. If you have a total disaster, you could either, if you have an orchestration and or automation uh, platform, you could actually create a DR workflow, which uh, where you can say, you know what, in case of a disaster, I want those 500 VMs that are replicated on the other side. We won't be able to spin them all up from the rubric platform. It's basically, it's not fast enough. So you can actually, um, so what you'll do is you can say, okay, you know, let's take the 50 most important VMs, or I don't know, 60, 70 most important VMs. Spin those up immediately straight from the Rubik platform, have them back up and running, uh, storage vMotion, then back to the primary platform on the secondary site, and, and go from there, right? You could either say, okay, I want to recover or basically do a traditional restore of files and folders. Um, if you want to do it at a VM level, I would say best practice is batches, right? Batches based on the, the speed uh, and size of the VMs. So we can completely automate it. We're just not able to spin up 500 VMs at the same time. Um, because, you know, limited resources of the backup platform. Yeah. And I, I, to be honest, I think... Well, we could do it if you, if you add, if, if that's a real, it is a necessity to be able to do that because we do have customers that say, you know what, I have a smaller environment, I have a primary storage platform on location A, 
I don't have that primary storage platform on uh, location B, but I could you know, create some hosts uh, or, or place some hosts on that secondary location. We'll oversize the Rubik platform a little bit on the secondary side and will actually act as a VR storage platform uh, in case of emergency. Uh -huh. uh, you could and uh, it goes without saying that there are features and functions in the Utanix solution that allows availability where all data in data center A is uh, synchronously also replicated to another data center so that if data center fails you just spin up all your VMs, could be thousands of VMs, you spin them up and off you go. So for if as long as the data that you want for your disaster recovery is a data that is very recent, then uh, you actually uh, don't need to leverage uh, Rubrik. You can do it straight from the Utanix platform. Excellent. Excellent. So I guess a lot of it will depend on the actual workloads and the structure of that workload for the individual organization. But the facilities are there both within what we have with the Nutanix platform for the immediate availability current data and within Rubrik for the recovery of missing VMs or any missing data that was affected during the disaster itself. So it, it sounds exactly. like a very comprehensive solution. Rubrik and Nutanix together can take on any disaster recovery use case. Uh, just checking through for any other questions. Uh, I have one from my perspective. Both of you mentioned the use of APIs, application program interfaces, available within your products. In the world where we're developing the software-defined data center, how important is that API functionality and how do you see that developing in each of your products? I'll start, if we may, with you, Jan. Just like Rubrik, Nutanix also has a fully documented uh, RESTful API. Actually, um, if you would uh, look into our user interface, which is a HTML5 user interface, which looks very much like Rubrik, what a coincidence, it actually every single button you click is an API call. So that means every function, every data point is available and can be manipulated through RESTful API uh, calls. Uh, it's fully documented, uh, searchable, and it's stable, meaning that it is actually designed to make sure that you can uh, hook your Nutanix cluster into a larger orchestration uh, solution. And this could be orchestration through OpenStack or through even Realize or anything else you want to use to orchestrate multiple components together. And if you look at the importance of API, this is only growing. Um, if you look at platforms such as uh, Facebook or Twitter or uh, even Airbnb or, or other type of web scale applications, they are exchanging amongst each other 10,000 of API calls every minute. So the API is actually the way or the platform to orchestration full automation. And having this standardized and documented and stable and available for every piece of data and function is key to the future of the software defined data center. I, I fully agree with Jan. So if you, uh, I, I just came uh, a couple of days ago, I had a meeting at a very large government data center running thousands of VMs. And they said, you know, without an open call, without a RESTful API, a product that doesn't support a RESTful API for 100%, it will never come into our data center again. Right? And I think that is a very clear message that this is where we have to go as, as IT infrastructure, people, consultants, vendors, uh, etc. A lot of IT administrators, if they haven't done so already, you know, you see more and more people diving into Python, diving into PowerShell, because we have to automate all those manual processes. And the only way to do that, to truly do that with a, you know, a scalable data center is through the use of a RESTful API. Yeah, I would, I would agree entirely. In order to create this software-defined data center, the software has to be able to talk to one another, to cause events, to analyze the results of events, and to create that automation and integration that we need within the data center to achieve anything like the scale and speed that's required for these kind of applications. Uh, one small thing is that, you know, um, we have customers now already that says, you know, you, you've developed a fantastic HTML5 GUI, but I never want to see it in my life. I'm going to push everything out through API calls. I'm going to do all my restores, all my configuration. Everything is done without a GUI from a, a management platform. You know, and that's only going to grow. Absolutely. So I think we're coming to the end of today's session. We've run slightly over time. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jan, for the session today. It's been very informative. For our audience, I'd like to leave you with a couple of thoughts. So today what we did was we looked at the two fundamental building blocks of that hyper-converged software-defined data center. 
First of all, Nutanix with the hyper-converged compute, memory, virtualization and storage layer that's provided in a highly available web scale architecture, meaning we've got that resilience throughout the entire structure. And that resilience is then supported by the means to ensure that our VMs and all of our data are always highly available through a simple, reliable, SLA-driven backup and restore function with simplified management. So I think what we're seeing here is that building blocks that we see as fundamental for you to be able to build your own software-defined data centers and to get the benefits of the Facebook, Google, and similar style software-defined data center. I hope you enjoyed today's session. We will, of course, be making sure that this session is available. It's been recorded, and a version of that will be made available later today. And you may be able to go back to it or share with colleagues who may have missed the session. Thank you very much, Jan. Thank you very much, Derry, and hope everyone has a good afternoon.